All right, the Spirit in the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation. And this is lesson number five in that series. And the title of this lesson is Atonement Theories. Atonement Theories. Well, before I get to atonement theories, we'll do just a bit of review. Get us back into, the, uh, into this topic here. So we said that there are two main goals in human history in which the Holy Spirit is active in accomplishing. The first of which is the cross of Christ. Everything that works together to bring Christ to the cross, the Holy Spirit is at work doing that. That's the first goal. And the second goal we haven't talked about yet is the glorification of the church. You know, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, he's at work you know, in the glorification of the church. I also said that in the Old Testament period, the Holy Spirit was active in preparing the way to the cross. Really, there's a way to the cross? Absolutely, there's a way to the cross. What did he do? Well, in the creation, he was forming the actual creation into its final format. Remember it says in Genesis, and he hovered over the deep, that, that Hebrew word vibrates. You know. Scholars tell us that the idea is that the Holy Spirit brought into formation the things that God had created that had not yet been formed. Uh, Genesis 1.1. Uh, uh, he also sustained the creation after the fall of man. After the fall of man, you have the devolution of the creation, the corruption of the creation after the sin of man. The Holy Spirit was active in sustaining the creation. The creation has to be there and has to be sustained to be able to support mankind until when? <laughs> until the cross at the very least. And so the Holy Spirit active in that, uh, in that work. Uh, Job 34, Psalm 104, I mean, I read those passages uh, in the past. What else was the Holy Spirit doing in the Old Testament to prepare the way? Well, he was working with the nation of Israel. He empowered them to be the chosen people of God. You know, we said uh, Jesus was to enter into human history. Well, how was he going to enter into human history? Was he going to be a Midianite, a Midianite? Mesopotamian, what was he going to be? Well, God said, chose one man and out of that one man, he created a nation that had its culture, its history, its religion, its laws, you know all for the purpose of creating a historical stage upon which Jesus Christ could enter in. So who was Jesus going to be the son of God? He was going to be a Jew. That special nation that God created for that very purpose of providing you know, that stage that brings Jesus onto the, you know, the stage of a human history. Well, who was working with the Jewish nation, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Who was the, the power working with them? Well, the Holy Spirit. And again, we read you know, the gifted leaders that they had, the inspired prophets, the miraculous individual works that were done, all powered by the Holy Spirit. And then we said, the Holy Spirit was also working in the ministry of Jesus. He, uh, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to speak from the Father. Uh, the miracles that were performed were performed through the power of the Holy Spirit. All the prophecy that was fulfilled was first of all spoken through the power of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and then fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And then of course, the most critical moment, the resurrection of Jesus upon which our religion is based, our hope is based, 
Well, how was that powered? Well, that was powered by the Holy Spirit. So you ask, you know, what's the Holy Spirit doing? Well, he's at work in creation, maintaining the, the nation of Israel and bringing about the ministry of Jesus. So all of this activity by the Holy Spirit over centuries of time led to God the Father's first goal being achieved. And the first goal of the Father was the death of Jesus on the cross. That was goal number one uh, for the Father, the cross of Jesus Christ. So this morning I want to talk to you about the significance of the cross. We've said that the first goal of the Godhead, the Trinity, was the cross. The question at this point is, what is the significance of this? Why is this so important? Well, the cross of Jesus is important because it accomplishes what we refer to as atonement. The cross establishes atonement. This is not a word that we use you know, in normal conversation. How many times have you used the word atonement this week, this month, this year, except in church? Remove church, remove Bible study. How many times do you use the word atonement? Well, no, not, not, very, not very often. Um, and it, 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 we're not always sure about its meaning. Over the centuries, there have been many theories developed as to its exact meaning and application. In other words, what we think atonement means today is not exactly what people have always thought atonement meant. There's a development of thought throughout the centuries, okay? So we have, uh, first of all, something called the ransom theory the ransom theory, actually a, a kidnapping term. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse six, Paul writes of Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time, meaning the gospel was preached about this at the proper, at the proper time. So this was an expression, ransom, borrowed from the slave trade. It was the price for freedom paid for a slave. You want that slave, you want, he wants, he want, she wants to buy the, their freedom. The ransom price is the freedom price, okay? The early patristic writers, in other words, you know, we call them the, the fathers, the early fathers of the church, patristic, pater from father. The early patristic writers, from the first to the fifth century, believed that Jesus' death on the cross was a price paid to the devil in exchange for the souls of sinful men and women. That was the theological thinking in the first five centuries. Of course, there's no scriptural support for this interpretation. It's correct in a sense it's a buyback, you know, in a sense, but paying the devil for the souls of men, not accurate biblically. Another theory is the moral influence theory. Peter Abelard, he was a Benedictine monk and a theologian. His theory was that Jesus died to show men how wicked they were. And once they recognized this wickedness, it would influence them to turn to God. In other words, the sheer magnitude of God's sacrifice would you know, impress men so violently that they would turn away from their sins and turn to God. Abelard argued that Jesus' death was not a ransom, but it was a, a blinding flash of God's love, which by sheer ethical and moral power would persuade men to repent. And so the moral influence theory was 
what Peter, Peter Abelard said. Of course, this theory, however, completely ignores the biblical concept of God's justice and His righteousness, which require an accounting for sins already committed. In other words, it's good that men turn from sin and turn to God, but what about justice and punishment for wrongs committed? Who and how are these offenses and the damage and hurt that they cause? How are these things taken care of? Paul says very briefly in Romans 6, 23, the beginning of the passage there, for the wages of sin, the price of sin is death. That's what sin causes, it causes death. And not just death like you, you die, but all kinds of death. You know, a, a, a country that lives under a dictatorship that crushes the, the, the people into poverty and they live a miserable, you know, freedomless life, you know, that's death, that, that's living death. So sin you know, causes all kinds of death until actual death uh, occurs. Uh, then we have another theory, the substitutionary or satisfaction theory developed by Martin Luther and Jean Calvin. John Cal we say John Calvin, but he was French, Jean Calvin. Their explanation said that Jesus died on the cross in our place. He suffered a death that we as sinners deserved to suffer. Now this idea was the most developed idea theologically, meaning it, it was the closest to the Bible uh, that had been developed. These two writers, theologians stressed the point that the cross was a payment, but the revolutionary idea for that particular time was that God himself made the payment for sin on the cross. And so the dominant belief at the time when Catholicism was the major religious influence was that the sinner had a part to play in his redemption through various religious experiences. That was the dominant theory at the time. In other words, during monolithic Catholicism, right, during the Middle Ages, before the Protestant uh, Reformation, the, 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 the theology was that God does some of the work through Christ and you do some of the work through your good works. What kind of, what kind of good works? Well, saying the rosary, for you know, the rosary, you know, the beads and that, the prayer thing. Saying the rosary so many times. Pilgrimages, if you could afford it, to the Holy Land. Going to mass on certain days. I remember as a, as a young boy, I remember in seventh grade, every Friday, every, every first Friday of the month, uh, you know, the teacher would say, all right, everybody line up. You know, we'd line up outside of our classroom and he'd march us down to the church, the Catholic church, St. Brendan's, I still remember St. Brendan's. And we'd go to St. Brendan's Friday morning at 11 o'clock, we'd leave the school and you know, down the street and, and we'd all troop into St. Brendan's and there would be first Friday mass that they would, you know, that the priest would have. Mass was a, you know, the Catholic service, you know, and there would be communion served, you know, first Friday mass, first Friday of the month mass. And we were taught that if you attended every one of those masses every month, in other words, 12 in a row, you would not have to go to purgatory. In Catholic teaching, if some of you grew up Catholic, you might, you might remember this. There was heaven, there was purgatory, there was hell. If you died 
with a mortal sin on your soul. In other words, you, you committed a mortal sin. Mortal sin is like murder, adultery, you know, that type, mortal sin. If you had one of those sins, unforgiven, you were toast, you, you went straight to hell. But if you died and you were just an ordinary, you didn't commit adultery, but you lusted a lot, you know. <laughs> You, 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 didn't, you didn't defraud the government, but you lied a lot, you know what I mean, to get by. You know? Those were venial sins, venial sins. Not, not mortal, but they, they were lesser sins on your soul. And if you died with those venial sins unforgiven, then you would go to purgatory. Purgatory was a place where you suffered. You waited and you suffered until you, know, you had you, you know, worked off all of the sins, were finally cleaned off, you know, and it was like a pre-cleaner. You know? uh, and then after you had spent enough time in purgatory, then you would be allowed to go to heaven. And some of you are smiling, but I mean, this, I, mean we, we, I sat there and I learned this you know, as, a, as a boy. Uh, my, when my father uh, passed away, um, you, could have a, you could have the name of your loved one mentioned by the priest at mass. And so at a certain point in the mass, he would say, and we pray for the departed. And he would have like a list, you know, and sometimes he would read it and sometimes it was too long and he would say, well, you know, we have a list, you know, and we pray for the, we pray for the departed, you know. Well, that list was made up of people who had purchased a mass for a loved one who had departed. My father had 130,000 masses purchased, you know, for him, you know my history and you know my dad's history, so yeah, 130,000 masses purchased for him. My mother and I, of course, we had no life insurance. We, we didn't have two nickels to rub together after he passed, but the church got a lot of money you know, to, to do this. You know. And this was in 1960 something. You know. So you can imagine what it was like back in the Middle Ages. Same system going on, paying for your sins financially, gifts to the church to purchase what were called indulgences. Remember that? Indulgences. You know, today we say, what's an indulgence? Well, usually the word indulgence is coupled with the word grandmother. You know, grandma is very indulgent, you know, she's so forgiving, she's so, she lets stuff roll by, you know what I mean? That she would have never let go by with her own kids, but with her grandkids, you know, whatever. You want a Coke before supper? Sure, go ahead. You want some ice, you know? They were called indulgences because you purchased the indulgence. It meant you bought your way into heaven. And this was, by the way, the last straw for uh, Martin Luther. It was uh, one of the bishops that came through his town selling indulgences that finally, ah, you know, he's pulling his hair out because Martin Luther, was a, he was a scholar. He was able to read the Bible in its original language and he knew that was not a biblical thing. You know, that was not a New Testament thing. That was not in the Bible. And of course, you know, we know the history from that. He revolted, so to speak, and the Reformation began. And his, his objective was to change the Catholic Church from within. You know, a lot of institutions like that. People want to change it from within. And of course, you know, that nearly got him killed because they, you know, they, they didn't want to change the system. The system was going to stay the way it was. So this substitutionary satisfaction theory here, although it was all wrapped up in Catholic pomp and ceremony,
and it was given Latin terms and a lot of mystery through candle lighting and holy water. It was basically a system of salvation by works and the Protestant Reformation was largely a reaction and a rejection of this trend in the Catholic Church. So there's the substitutionary satisfaction theory brought out uh, by uh, uh, the people of that time. And then we have another theory called the martyr theory, a much more modern liberal theologian, theological position. This theory explaining the cross and atonement said that Jesus was a great martyr dying for godly principles. And so they put Jesus, they meaning the, the theologians, they put uh, Jesus in the same category as Gandhi, for example, or Martin Luther King. Jesus was one of those type people, you know, dying for a, you know, a social cause to, to the, for the betterment of mankind. So this gave Jesus and his death credit for the Christian movement, just as Martin Luther King is credited with the civil rights movement in the United States. However, this theory also denied his deity. You don't have to be God to start a social movement. And then there's the just and justifier theory, which we believe is the most developed and most biblically accurate theological theory concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.26, for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So uh, this passage speaks to the reason for Christ's death on the cross and the essential meaning of atonement this just and justifier theory. This theory explained, first of all, the just, God's perfect holiness and justice. He is the giver, he is the keeper, and he is the executor of the law. God gives the law, God executes the law, God punishes the ones who disobey the law, right? And of course, those who violate his law with sin, uh, he punishes. And the punishment is death, not just separation of the soul from the body, that's physical death, but also separation of the soul from God, that's eternal death. So the duty of a just God requires him to carry out the demands of his law. There's no exception or else the law is compromised and made void. And we have an example of this principle, you know, that if you violate the law, you, you, you void it, it, may, it makes it you know, uh, unworkable. There's an example of this and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Romans 3 uh, also, 326 also talks about the justifier. That God is the justifier as well. Because God is love, 1 John 4 verse 8. In other words, God's perfect love also impels him to save the lost sinner. His law condemns the sinner, but his love moves him to do something about that, to try to save the sinner. His love for mankind moves him to find a way of rescue without compromising his law. That's the, that's the trick, by the way. How, how, do you, how do you save man without compromising the law? And so then we have Atonement, that's, you know, if you wonder, where does atonement come in? 
right here. That's why I say the plan of salvation is vicarious atonement. That's where it fits, right here. So the plan of atonement permits God to fulfill His perfect justice and His perfect love in a single act. Now the dictionary defines the word atonement as a reparation for a wrong or an injury. Some synonyms for the word atonement are restitution, or redemption, or amends, or expiation, or propitiation. All these words, they all mean the same thing, okay? And the Bible uses these various words when speaking of what Jesus accomplished with His death on the cross. So, the atonement allows God to be both the just, and the justifier at the same time. Vicarious atonement is when someone other than the guilty party pays the price that the law demands for sin. That's why we call it vicarious atonement. If it was just atonement, well, each sinner would have to make atonement, but it's vicarious atonement. Somebody else other than the sinner makes the atonement. And who is that someone else? Well, it's Jesus. So someone might say, well, why doesn't God just forgive everybody? After all, he's God, he can do what he wants. Why go through all this rigmarole here? And the answer to this is that saving mankind with a blanket forgiveness only solves half of the problem. I mean, who or how is the debt required by God's own perfect law paid? Who, who will make justice for those, for example, who were murdered, and let, let's use Hitler, okay, because uh, I won't get into any trouble with anybody. If, if I, he's the only guy you can, you can really talk against now and nobody will you know, cancel you. <laughs> I, won't, I won't lose my website if I mention Hitler is a bad guy. Everybody agrees that Hitler is a bad guy. But all kidding aside, where's the justice for the people who died at his hands, who starved to death in concentration camps, who were burned, who were tortured, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And we're not talking about one or two people, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that were murdered at his request. Where's the justice for that? So if God gives a blanket for God, ah, come on, everybody come on into heaven. Well then, wait a minute. What about the things that this guy did? Where's the justice for that? That's why there's no blanket forgiveness. A preview of this dilemma is demonstrated in Daniel. You know, this business of you know, uh, the just and the justifier. How do you, how do you, you know, satisfy the law and, and still save the sinner? God provides us a story, and I think you're all familiar with it, so I'm not going to read everything here. In this story, Darius, king of the Medes, made a law condemning to death anyone not worshiping his image. Now, this was a political maneuver to consolidate his power and throne over a very diverse population. Daniel, a Jewish exile in Babylon, who was favored by this king for his wisdom and service to the crown, refused to bow down to the image as this would violate God's prohibition about worshiping images. So Daniel was eventually charged with a capital offense by other officials of the king who were jealous of Daniel's favor with the monarch. And we know the story, Darius the king was faced with an impossible dilemma. How does he save someone that he favored without jeopardizing the integrity of his law? Uh, if he let Daniel go, who would take his laws seriously? 
You know, if, he, if he lets one go, he's got to let them all go. So if you weaken the law of the king, you weaken the king and then you weaken the stability of his kingdom which rested upon the law. Okay, so we read in Daniel chapter six, it says, then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, these are the bad guys here, the jealous leaders, they say, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, that's the law, but he keeps making his petition, meaning Daniel continued to pray to the God, to his God, three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind to, on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king was wavering. Oh man, I, I don't want to kill Daniel. He's important to me. I like this guy. He's good for the kingdom. And so the other guys, you know, they see that the king is wobbling here and they go you know, to kind of you know, they say, hey king, you know the law. You can't, you know, if you break the law, you can't break the law. Once the king makes a law, you can't go back on your word. And so, it says, then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. He was doomed, no chance for salvation. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted his God. So we note, I'll just go back in verse 14, the king tried to find a loophole to save Daniel, but he couldn't. And then in verse 15, we see a law is a law, no exceptions. And that's the principle, right? No exceptions. Verse 18, the king prayed for a solution because he had no way of keeping his law and saving his friend. It was one or the other. In verse 22, Daniel was saved by God, why? Because he obeyed God's higher law, even if it meant his death. And then in verse 23, faith was the basis for victory for Daniel. So, what Daniel, or excuse me, what Darius could not do, which was to be just and merciful at the same time, God accomplished through vicarious atonement. He was able to maintain his law, but at the same time, he was able to show mercy to all those who sinned. He was just, in that he satisfied the demands of his law, the demand of his law, which was death for disobedience. And he was merciful in that he sent his son in the flesh of man to vicariously, meaning in the place of someone else. Why? Because man couldn't do it. You know? There could be a volunteer and say, hey, look, you know what? 
Never mind Jesus, I'll go, you know, Herman over here, he's going to go, Herman's volunteered to die, you know. Why is that no good? Well, Herman's a sinner. His sacrifice is no good. You got to be perfect, no sin. And Jesus, of course, lived a perfect and sinless life. He was merciful, meaning God was merciful in that he sent his only son in the flesh of man to vicariously suffer death or separation from God as payment, atonement for the sins of all mankind. And so the result of the cross, justice, the law was satisfied. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, that's a nice idea up there, some ethereal idea, justice, you know, but you know what? It's justice in your life that was satisfied. Your lies, your adulteries, your sins, the law that you and me, I, I'm, I'm with you guys, the law, all the laws of God that all of us have broken and continue to break despite our efforts, that law that still you know, judges us, that law was satisfied by Jesus, not just for the people back then, but for us too. I mean, that's the good news. So the law is satisfied. The law that demands that every wrong thing that I have ever done should be atoned for, should be made up for, should be paid for. That law, Jesus paid for on the cross. I could start listing for you the worst sins that I, I'm not going to do it, so don't get excited, but you know what I'm saying? I could start listing my worst sins and say this worst sin here, punishable by death, Jesus paid for that sin. It's gone. And all of you here, young and old, think of your worst sins and realize that when you look at the cross there that's behind the screen, that cross paid for that sin. Brothers and sisters, that's the good news. That's the message we need to get out of the building. Another question, and I'll, I'm almost done here. Another question, what does this have to do with the Trinity? Because remember, we're studying the Godhead and the Trinity. What does that have to do with that? Well, the answer is there has to be a Trinity. There has to be a dynamic Godhead. Because if there's no Trinity, then there's no Jesus. And if there's no Jesus, there's no vicarious atonement. And if there's no vicarious atonement, there's no forgiveness. If there's no forgiveness, there's no salvation. If there's no salvation, there's no eternal life. If there's no eternal life, there's no gospel. If there's no gospel, there's no hope. And all we have is this, I don't mean church, all we have is this, this life, CNN. That's all we have, Hollywood. China, politics, that's it, that's all we've got if there's no, no, no trinity. So let's uh, summarize and wrap it up with some question. What does all of this discussion about the cross and the atonement have to do with the Holy Spirit? The answer to that is, the cross is the answer to the question, what exactly does the Holy Spirit do? The other answer is because in the end, he really does just one thing. Another question, where does the Holy Spirit fit into all of this? You know, I thought the Holy Spirit did a lot of things in relation to, to, to man. You know, maintain the creation, the Jewish nation, the ministry of Jesus, so on and so forth. Well, all of this is true, he does all these things, but all of these things are directly related to one major thing. They are, they are spokes in a wheel whose hub 
is the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, each spoke, the creation, the Jewish nation, the gospel, the prophets, the this, the that, maintaining the creation. You know, all of this, all of it works together towards the cross. Remember I told you, two things that God is interested in. One, the cross of Christ. Two, the glorification of the church. Everything else is wallpaper. The Roman Empire, wallpaper. Alexander the Great, wallpaper. World War II, wallpaper. Everything is in service to this. Take away this hub and the spokes are not connected and the wheel cannot function and makes no sense. So, the Father initiates the plan of salvation, which is vicarious atonement, and He elects or chooses the Son. And the Son reveals the plan and fulfills the required atonement with His death on the cross, burial, and resurrection. What then does the Holy Spirit do in this plan of salvation? The Holy Spirit raises up the cross of Christ before all men. John 12, 32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. All the activity in the Old Testament leads to this one event. All of the activity of the Holy Spirit from the creation until this very moment today, and then forward until the second coming of Jesus at the end of the world, are connected to raising up the cross of Jesus Christ, whether it's done externally in the world or internally in your heart. The Holy Spirit raises up the cross of Christ. This raising up of the cross of Christ until He returns is what the Holy Spirit does with regard to the Godhead's plan of salvation. That's what He does. Everything else points to this and works to this. All right, next, four ways that the Holy Spirit raises the cross of Christ to the world. And that we will talk about next time. I thank you for your attention.